traces meeting transmit traces is an acronym which means transmitting contentious, contentious cultural heritage with the arts and um, so we have uh, had a, a huge um, a, 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 a complete full day uh, of conference and pre presentations but now I'm really happy to welcome Sharon McDonald here in Klagenfurt. Sharon McDonald is a widely known expert in anthropology of Europe with a focus on museums, cultural heritage, memory studies and cultural sociology. She carried out anthropological fieldwork in Scotland, in England and Germany and exploratory exploratory comparative research of ethnics, minorities, heritage in museums and heritage sites in China. In her book, Nedrated the Nazi Past in Nuremberg and Beyond, published 2009 by Rutledge, she introduced the term difficult heritage to examine how, I quote, a city and a nation deal with a legacy of perpetrating atrocity and how contemporary identities are nitrated and shaped in the face of concrete reminders of a past that most wish they did not have, unquote. Currently, Sharon MacDonald is Alexander von Humboldt Professor in the Institute of European Ethnology, Humboldt Bers Universität zu Berlin. She holds a chair in social anthropology with emphasis on cultural heritage and museum studies and directs the karma She loves this appreciation, <laughs> I heard. Uh, the Center for Anthropological Research in Museum and Heritage Studies. Her current research projects include Making Difference in Berlin. One, only two uh, projects, Transforming Museums and Heritage in the 21st Century, which is funded by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and Curating Profusion, a theme within the Heritage Futures Project funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in UK and Contentious Collections. In 2012, she, she joined the University of York as Anniversary Professor for, of cultural, cultural Anthropology. Prior to that, she was Professor of Social Anthropology at the University of Manchester and Chief of Sheffield. In 2007, she held an Alexander von Humboldt visiting professorship in the Department of European Ethnology in Berlin. Her recent publications include Memorial Lens, Heritage and Identity in Europe Today, 2013, and as a general editor, the International Handbooks in Museum Studies. In our project, Traces, funded under the U European Horizon 2020 program, she is a work package of a work package leader of the work package contentious collection, collections dealing with museological aspects of the project to conduct basic research and theories out of local studies and projects on contentious collect, collections. Today, she will be talking about tracing and redrawing the lines of difficult and contentious heritage, which she defines as following, I quote, the difficult heritage is concerned with histories and pasts that do not easily fit with self-identities of the groups of whose pasts or histories they are part. Instead of affirming positive self-images, they potentially disrupt them or may threaten to open up social difference and conflicts. D further, quote, difficult heritage deals in unsettling histories rather than the kinds of heroic or progressive histories with which museums and heritage sites have more traditionally been associated. Dear Sharon, we are really happy that you have been coming to Klavenkurt this week. Now we all would like to listen to your reflections on tracing and redrawing the lines of difficult and contentious cultural heritage. Thank you very much indeed, Klaus, for that lovely introduction. I seem again to be the only thing between you and food, um, so I do apologise for this. Um, 
and I, it means that I'm terribly tempted to speak extremely quickly. <laughs> um, but if I do go too quickly, so I'm going to try and pace myself all the same. Um, if you just kind of subtly do that, then I'll slow down. <laughs> um, and I am going to read, because otherwise I might talk too uh, long, and also because I realised this was, this was my low point of the day. <laughs> so I thought I'd, I'd, I'd plan ahead. Um, but let me just go straight, straight, straight into it. So in a recent essay, which hasn't even reached publication, I asked the question of whether difficult heritage really is so difficult in contemporary Europe, and indeed beyond. My tentative answer, which I'll explain further shortly, was that it seems to be becoming less so, and indeed that a kind of showing of one's historical dirty washing in public has become considerably more widely practised and indeed often expected. My focus in that essay um, was on World War II and Holocaust history. One of the countries from which I gave some examples was Poland, another was Austria. From Poland, I noted, along uh, with others, the growth of contemporary art projects that seem to reflect upon, or that seek to reflect upon Poland's own history of anti-Semitism and post-Holocaust Jewish absence, and to challenge the country's predominant image of itself as a victim. Some of these have been prompted um, by historian Jan Tomasz Gross's well-known and controversial book, um, Neighbours, uh, The Destruction of the Jewish Community in Jedwabne, Poland, which was published in 2000. In the book, he told of how the slaughter of Jews in the village of Jedwabne was carried out not by the German invaders, but by the Polish villagers, with Gross estimating the numbers of those murdered at 1,600, considerably more than the official estimate of 250. So the book led to considerable discussion and also resistance. One artist for whom Gross's book um, was influential was Rafael Petrievsky, born in Gdansk in 1969. In one project, he began painting the slogan, I miss you Jew, onto walls in various places. On more than one occasion, he was charged with damage to property for graffiti, but also with anti-Semitism for using the word Jew. Other artistic actions also sought to remind of earlier Jewish presence and contemporary absence, such as these chairs uh, empty but for a kippah. An accompanying website to which people were invited to post memories of Jews they'd known shows another mode in which he sought to engage others in his project of shifting collective remembrance. But probably drawing most uh, attention was Betryevsky's um, The Barn is Burning, an artistic action in 2010, um, which was uh, carried out on the anniversary of the massacre, um, which had included um, Jewish villagers being burnt to death uh, in the barn. Now, for this work, um, what he did was he made a public call uh, for Poles to send him blank pieces of paper which represented their past anti-Semitic thoughts or actions, and these were stacked up in the barn. Making a speech um, uh, in which he referred to his Polish identity and a wish to, and I quote, change the place that history gave me, Betryevsky then set the barn alight, leaving it to burn to the ground, all filmed for national television, among other recordings. So, as Erica Lehrer, who I'm delighted, I uh, can't see her right now, but that she's uh, here today, um, who's also part of um, a project that's brought us um, here to Klagenfurt today, um, with Ma Magd Magdalena Valigorska, as they point out, while this work was clearly a reminder of past perpetration by non-Jewish Poles, 
it was also problematic. In particular, it was set up as a symbolic act of, and I quote them, shedding the identity as perpetrator. In rather Christianized imagery, it performs a rite of atonement, the new pole arising purified from the burning up of the bad thoughts and actions of the past. Despite the problems with this particular work, however, it remains an example of what Lera and Valigorska see as a new genre of memory work art projects, and that's their term, memory work projects, growing in numbers that actively seek to provoke debate. And I quote from them, radically critical they say, such works create openings onto intimate spheres of emotion, including fear, guilt, shame, curiosity, pleasure. They can act as catalysts for dialogue and new social networks, and at the same time be highly polarising. End of quote. Well, accumulating numbers of works produced by individual artists or historians and by local groups constitute one pulse of some of the contours or lines of how difficult heritage is being addressed. They show us some dimensions of ongoing collective memory, or as I put it in my book, Memory Lands, one form of past presencing. Another pulse, however, is what happens in major public institutions. Typically, like large ships, they're less agile and move more slowly. And when they do, they might be able to carry more people, and they usually leave a larger wake. In the case of Poland, there's been a rather remarkable wave of activity and planned activity where its public institutions, especially its museums, are concerned. Since the opening of the Warsaw Uprising Museum in 2004, a string of other museums on topics connected to World War II, the Polish past, and the Holocaust uh, has been begun, and these include the Polish History Museum, the Museum of the Second World War, and the Museum of the People's Republic of Poland, um, neither of which is finished, and Polin, the Museum of the History of Polish Jews, that opened in Warsaw in 2014. Well, Polin acts as a high-profile and enduring reminder of a thousand years of vibrant Jewish presence in Poland as well as of the extermination of so much of that and the role of non-Jewish Poles as well as Germans within that. Although its displays, so the content, were not funded by the Polish state, the museum seemed nevertheless a sign of a more widespread turn towards acceptance of a more nuanced position on the Polish role in Holocaust a move away from the innocent uh, victim of German aggression position. In my unpublished unpub article, I took this museum as one example of what seemed to me to be a growing acceptance of acknowledging and publicly addressing difficult heritage in Poland and also in many other European countries and indeed elsewhere. Last week, however, I had cause to think again. It was announced that the Polish government, the right-wing Law and Justice Party, uh, intends to halt plans for, for the new museum of the Second World War, and to do so primarily on the grounds uh, that it does not express the Polish point of view, and that's one of the statements that's been made. The museum was due to open next year in Gdansk and is already substantially complete. It's a massive project with 12 stories, uh, five of them underground, and costing around 100 million uh, euros. 37,000 objects have been gathered for the new museum, some of them from local people in Poland, um, but many others from many uh, other countries elsewhere in the world. Now, that gathering of objects from other places was part of what was to be distinctive, indeed in some ways a first about this museum, namely that it would present World War II not from a national perspective and actually not even from a European perspective, um, but from a global one, 
with perspectives from many different countries uh, and many parts of the world. So assisted by academics from Belgium, Germany, Israel, Russia, the UK and the US, as well as from Poland, it pushed the story of World War II further back into a historical background than many museums uh, normally do. And it also included a broader geographical scope. So as one of the visiting, the advising academics, uh, Timothy Snyder, a history professor from Yale, wrote in a lengthy piece in the New York Review of Books last week, this global perspective challenged many aspects of the way in which World War II is typically represented in national narratives that have been predominant in museums, predominant not only in Poland, but, but elsewhere too. So for example, the extended temporal perspective highlighted uh, a longer international history of trying to pl placate and accommodate Hitler. In the museum, this was to be part of a narrative seeking to show how such processes of accommodation, um, or to show such processes of accommodation as part of the experience of war, as Snyder puts it. Now that does mean that Poland would have been depicted as engaged in accommodation processes with its population collaborating with various regimes. But it would not have been characterised as alone in this. The global scope would also have shown collaboration and accommodation in terms of what Snyder describes as an, an everyday truth about war. What the law and justice um, a uh, party or government objects to, however, is any depiction of Poland as, as participating in crimes of World War II. Under its politics of memory policy, it wants the country firmly in the role of victim or heroic resistor against the German National Socialists. Even though the museum was to include much about Nazi atrocities and about resistance, this was not enough for the government. The party has already charged the historian Jan Tomasz Gross, who uh, wrote uh, Neighbours and more recently a book called Fear, Antisemitism in Poland after Auschwitz. Uh, they, they've charged him with insulting the Polish nation. Law and Justice has also proposed a new law uh, that would forbid the use of the phrase Polish death camps, insisting that only Nazi German death camps be used. It produced a warning to be shown before all screenings of the film Ida, a film in which Polish anti-Semitism and complicity with the Nazis is depicted. Well, according to a letter posted um, by the director of the Museum of the uh, Second World War on the um, museum's website uh, last Friday, um, what the Law and Justice Minister Minister of Culture and National Heritage is now proposing um, is to dismiss the current management of the museum and to merge the project um, with oops, oh, the pages um, with uh, the as yet not even started uh, proposed uh, museum proposed by law and justice museum of the, the Battle of Vesterplatte. Now that battle is the one at which uh, Polish forces resisted the, a, a, a German surprise attack on the Baltic coast for seven days in um, September 1939. Um, and what it does, uh, it shows the kind of angle that law and justice wishes to promote. Now, quite what will come out of all this, it's all very, very current, and I didn't look at the news today, maybe there's some other development of this, but it's quite hard to see. Um, now, of course, Poland is just one case, and in focusing upon it, I don't want to try to make it symptomatic of a broader um, European shift to more conservative politics of memory. Actually, sorry, let me just... I missed a slide there. That's actually just showing the website as it was last Friday, and you can download some of the letters and so on that are being posted, posted up there. Um, it's kind of a bit ironic because you also see the planned timelines and projections of, of uh, what it was to be like. So it's really at a very, very advanced uh, stage. Um, 
So yeah, I don't want to make it symptomatic of a broader European shift to a more conservative politics of memory, though the growing strength of right-wing parties in many European countries clearly makes this a disturbingly plausible possibility. But what I do want to do is to use this as a case for pointing out just how contentious the past, in this case the past of World War II and Holocaust, remains in Europe, and just how caught up in this cultural institutions such as museums inevitably are. This past, World War II and Holocaust, remains contentious even as the number of first-hand witnesses is dying out. The Polish about to be closed before it's even opened museum is far from being alone in this. Um, it, far from being alone in being controversial, sorry. So just as one example, Mos Moscow's new Jewish uh, Museum and Tolerance Centre, which opened in 2012, has been the subject of acrimonious arguments between our commentators, as some of us here uh, witnessed uh, in New York earlier this year. Some have accused the museum as basically being in the service of Putin, with, with others, including the US history professors on the advisory board, vigorously denying this. All of this tells us that the past matters, that it's still a focus of conflict within Europe as well as beyond. It tells us that heritage, the histories that we select to count as valuable and worth saving for the future, remain contentious. I also wanted to note the Gdansk case, however, to add a cautionary footnote to the argument that I made in my yet unpublished uh, but too late to be changed article. Um, but let me now just kind of briefly turn to that, what I was trying to do there and the longer thread of work of which that was part. So the article was entitled um, is difficult heritage still difficult? Why public acknowledgement of past perpetration may no longer be so unsettling to collective identities. Um, and the article was a discussion of developments since um, some of those that I made in that book that um, Klaus mentioned in 2009. And so there, as, as, as Klaus already mentioned, I kind of looked at what seemed to me a very interesting historic development historically and cross-culturally, which was that this marking of significant history, that is as heritage, as I put it there, a trustee's perpetrated and abhorred by the nation that committed them. And that seemed to me quite a remarkable thing. And we, we, there are many, many countries that don't do it and that historically haven't, and we, we saw this uh, move uh, towards that. And that has a, a big challenge to self identity when when you do do that so difficult heritage as i defined it then wasn't just any kind of past that might cause offense or upset um, and others you have used the term in in, in 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 those ways but i want to look specifically um, at the acknowledgements of past with negative impact for self-representation or put colloquially colloquially with showing your dirty uh, laundry in public um, and I wanted to specify it in that way, not because I don't think all, all the others are important, because I, it seems to me that analytically we should try to um, uh, understand that as a particular phenomenon. And there's a wider task, I think, not for now, for another time, to try to specify more and analyse more systematically um, ways in which different kinds of pasts uh, or heritage trouble the present. But in terms of this specific kind of self-challenging self -challenging difficulty, um, so what I did there was to document some of this uh, at different scales with the most detailed and in-depth in relation to the city of Nuremberg in Germany. Um, and I did that not because I thought it was a typical case, but because I thought it was a telling one. There, in the city, often thought of as the most Nazi for various reasons, especially the way its name attaches uh, to Nazi crimes. It was especially worth looking to see how the National Socialist past had been addressed or not. 
So by looking at the detailed debates uh, on the ground over the years since 1945, at who got involved, uh, when and how, and what kinds of cases were made for attending to or ignoring the past, um, the kinds of terms in which they might be resisted, for example, it was possible to get a handle on the local motivations involved and the forms that they took in practice. Now, I don't want to rehearse any of that here, but I want to know that one thing that it was possible to see happening kind of close up um, that I do think was something happening um, more widely and generally, so was a shift in the terms of the debates, so especially in the 1980s. And what happened was a kind of psychologization, medicalization, which turned acts of just not doing something, not talking about the past in various ways, uh, into significant acts of avoidance or repression. So no longer was just not engaging uh, with the problematic past something that just hadn't been done, or maybe even something that was a healthy getting over, because that was very...